The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. How do you feel about witnessing to unbelievers? Are you ever fearful? If so, today's program will be helpful. This is Grace in Focus from the Grace Evangelical Society. Friend, we're so glad that you have joined us today. At the end of the program, stay tuned and I'll give you more information about the Grace Evangelical Society and about our products and blogs and other things that you can find on our website. Right now, here's Bob Wilkin and Steve Elkins with today's discussion. Welcome to Grace in Focus. What's up today, Steve? Well, we got a question. It's really from an anonymous questioner, Bob. But he says, I have a question about overcoming a major glaring issue in my life of fear. I know that I should preach the gospel to people, but I have an all-encompassing fear that keeps me isolated in my apartment month after month, shirking what I know I should be doing. I've gone door-to-door with some Baptist friends in the past, but that was years ago. I've gone alone before. My voice shakes. My hands shake. My heart beats extremely fast, and I can barely breathe. Usually, I just chicken out. It's having a panic attack, it sounds like, Bob. What do you think about this? Yeah, I think this is a panic attack. In fact, I'm not sure what the year was. Maybe around the year 2000, I gave a message at our annual conference on evangelism, And I talked about the first time I shared my faith. I came to faith in September, and in December, I went to a Christmas conference at UCLA. We were leading up to the Rose Parade, and we were going to go to the Rose Parade and and evangelize at the Rose Parade. I'm at this Christmas conference, and they encouraged us to share our faith, and we were going to go out in the community. And I thought, well, before I do that, I just want to witness to somebody in the dorm. So there was a resident assistant there, and we were staying in the dorm over Christmas break. So I said, hey, I have a booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws, and it's dealing with Christianity. I wondered if I could go through it with you. The guy goes, sure. So I started reading through the four laws. I could hardly get a sentence out. I could hardly breathe. I was, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I'd go on like that. And the guy, at one point, after about law two, he says, how about if I read it? And I'm like, no, no, I got to do it myself. So he said, okay. So I made it through. And I ended up and gave a tape of that message to a psychologist. And after he listened to it, the psychologist came back to me. He said, Bob, do you know that was a panic attack? Mm -hmm. I said, no, really? He said, yeah. What our anonymous questioner is talking about is literally a panic attack. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I would suggest... If you're panicked about something, oftentimes there's some sort of underlying problem that's going on. Now, a person might have agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. doesn't sound like this person does. It sounds like he specifically has a panic attack about confronting strangers about Christ. I got over that, and I got to where I was able to walk up to strangers and talk to them. Even a week later, I'm at the Rose Parade, and I'm talking to people eight deep, and Mm -hmm. I'm reading through the four laws with them, and... But that doesn't mean that everybody needs to be going door to door, Mm -hmm. that everybody needs to be doing what we would call cold call evangelism. In fact, Steve, can you think of a verse anywhere in the Bible that tells us we're supposed to go door to door or we're supposed to walk up to people at bus stops or something like that? Can you think of any? Not for evangelism. We think maybe of the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, but that was addressed, first of all, to the apostles. And although I would agree that that rolls down for every generation, that we need to be making disciples, making disciples is something that's corporate. Mm -hmm. The local church does this. Mm -hmm. We're in the church age, and so it's not any one believer that's making all the disciples for a given church, right? It's the whole body that does this. Yes, every believer is called to confess Christ, but confessing Christ isn't quite the same as cold call evangelism. In fact, Hodges argues, and I think he's right, that mainly confessing Christ is gathering together with other Christians on the Lord's Day, and partaking of the Lord's Supper, praying to Him and crying out to Him, that's how we confess Christ publicly. Yeah, and as you know, in Romans 10, calling upon and confessing Him are synonymous. And in Acts, calling upon Him was shown basically by being baptized, a baptized right. believer. Paul was given permission or authority to bind all those who call on His name. Well, 
That's not talking about secret believers. By definition, you don't know who those are. Right. Those who call on the Lord were those who were baptized or at least in fellowship at a local church. So I think you could make the point that if you're having panic attacks about getting baptized, get over it. If you're having panic attacks about going to church, well, try to get over that. I mean, there are people with agoraphobia that really need to be on medication or go through counseling. I get it. Mm -hmm. But the truth is most of them can through counseling and medication get over that and can gather together with other believers, especially if it's in a small assembly. You don't have to go to a church of a thousand people. The point I guess I'm making is that our anonymous friend here is suffering. Somehow they have this wrong idea that they have to evangelize every person Mm -hmm. they meet. And I will tell you, when I was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, I was supposed to witness to a minimum of 10 people a week, Mm. normally Mm. one-on-one. Occasionally, I'd meet with three or four Mm. people at once, and Mm. I could count that as Mm. three or four people. But I found that at times I got legalistic about that. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I had the same experience, Bob. And something I wanted to share with this person is that we're making stumbling blocks that we don't need to have. How about a more relational approach to evangelism? Yeah, what is that? You know, winning the right to be heard and praying for this person. And this was Zane's method. And, of course, it's the method of young life that it's famous for. Which you were on staff for how many years? 25 or something? exactly. But trying to build a friendship and share Christ and the gospel and the natural course of those events. And, of course, pray for sensitivity to the Spirit. But along with that, I think the idea of planting seeds makes it so much easier. If we would see ourselves as a seed planter rather than having to give some canned gospel presentation that might have to last, by definition, a couple of minutes at least, just see ourselves as seed planters and throwing in spiritual comments and throwing in something that you heard at church or whatever, but just gradually building up to it. And then when you share the gospel, it doesn't have to be a big deal. You know, John six forty seven, you can say it in 2.3 seconds. <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. That is the gospel. It truly is that simple. It doesn't need a lot of explanation. And if you want to explain a little more, when you have that kind of style of evangelism, one, it doesn't feel canned. It doesn't tend to get legalistic. It becomes very natural and loving and relational. But even if you do do a presentation, I think we most certainly need to get out of our minds that we've got to close the deal. See, that was the thing. When I was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, it did not count as witnessing if you went through all four laws and did not read the prayer to them and say, would you like to pray this prayer? Right. In hindsight, I realized that was kind of silly. Most of the staff I knew, they weren't legalistic like I was. If they got to talk into a person and the person left after the second law or the third law, they'd say they witnessed to that person, right? (laughs) If I'm talking to someone about Jesus, well, then I'm evangelizing. And I may not get an opportunity to say everything I'd want to say, but it is nice if I tell them, if you believe in Jesus, you have everlasting life. Right. And this ties into uh, the end of our last episode where we were talking about Cornelius. There was no hand raising or walking an aisle or saying a prayer or closing the deal by Peter. As he spoke these words, Cornelius and his household believed. Yeah, and the same thing with Lydia in Mm -hmm. Acts 16. The same thing with everybody in Scripture. The woman at the well didn't pray some prayer, right? Nicodemus didn't throw a card in in the basket or something. There's no closing of the deal anywhere in the New Testament. The fact is, our job is just to share the gospel plainly, like John six forty seven, John three sixteen, or any number of verses like that. The Holy Spirit's the one who closes the deal. We have an article called One Verse Evangelism, which was by a former Navigator staff that is very good. And I have a number of articles that I wrote related to that. You don't have to be some kind of a genius, and you don't need a 30-minute presentation. I know a lot of people, and you probably do too, who like to give out a booklet. Yeah. The Living Water booklet is the Gospel of John with some notes. And by the way, the notes were written by Ed Underwood, Zane Hodges, Art Farstad, and I. Ed wrote the initial notes, and then Zane and I and Art edited them and modified them. That's a good one. I have a booklet called You Can Be Sure. Some people like to give out. There are several small tracks that Bob Bryant and uh, Zane Hodges 
wrote. One is you can be eternally secure. Mm -hmm. There's a number of these things people like to give out. Sometimes they give it out with a word like, hey, I'd just like to share this. It's been meaningful to me. I think you'd find it helpful. Some people like to say, this booklet can show you how you can be sure that you're going to heaven when you die. That's not real threatening, is it? No, that's awesome. I remember in seminary, I'd come out of a Baptist background and young life background, and I felt like I should be witnessing to everybody and, you know, even knocking doors and very legalistic, I guess you could say. And I went to Zane after class one day. I think I was taking him for Acts or the epistles of James and John. I can't remember. But I told him about the guilt that I was feeling, and he just calmed me down so quickly. He said, Steve, the best kind of sharing of Christ and the gospel is simply out of a heart filled with Christ. If you fill your heart with Christ, you're going to naturally talk about him. You don't have to worry about, he didn't say put notches in your belt or whatever, the way we might think of trying to witness and had to witness to 10 people, as you said, right. in Campus Crusade. But he said, just out of a heart filled with Christ, it's going to happen naturally. You don't need to worry about it. And you know what? I've never worried about it since. That is great. I guess as I wrap up, I can give you a quick anecdote about Sharon. My wife, Sharon, she never meets a stranger. She loves to visit with people. She walks up and talks to everybody. I can't tell you how many times she's told me that she's talked to someone and they said they'd pray for her and she would appreciate it. Or she would tell people she would pray for them. Mm Or how many times somebody said, I hope I make it to heaven, and she said, why do you say that? You know, if you believe in Jesus, you're guaranteed you're going to heaven. It's not by works. And Sharon doesn't think that's evangelism. Well, she just did. Right, but she just did. And Sharon does this all the time. And I think that's a great thing. If we just are open with people and talk to them like we're talking about anything else, well, then occasionally we're going to find opportunities to say, I hope you come to the point where you're sure you know you have everlasting love. Are you sure you know you're going to heaven? Wouldn't that be great? And they'll say, yeah. And then you might say, well, you know, Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Yeah, Sharon's living up to her name, Sharing. Oh, is that it? Sharing. Well, thank you all, and keep grace in focus. Zane Hodge's book, The Gospel Under Siege, a study about faith and works intention, is being offered this month to Grace and Focus listeners and available right now at half price through June the 30th when you use the discount code word SIEGE, S-I-E-G-E. Find this special offer at faithalone.org. Would you like to deepen your understanding of Scripture and the Christian life? Well, a great place to start is our website. It's faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We've got all kinds of free materials on the site available for you. One of those which is extremely popular is our magazine, Grace in Focus. It comes out six times a year. It's full color, easy to read, and people are really growing who read it. So stop by and get a free subscription at faithalone.org. We would like to thank all of our financial partners who help us keep this show going. All gifts are tax deductible and very much appreciated. If you'd like to find out how you can be a financial partner, visit us at faithalone.org. We are so happy when we hear from listeners. Maybe you've got a question or comment or feedback. If so, please send us a message. Here's our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next Grace in Focus, we begin a new series with Bob Wilkin and Dave Renfro, Jonah, the Reluctant Prophet. Join us. This is the Grace Evangelical Society reminding you to always keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.